Our scripture this morning is Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took their spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. May God add his blessing and understanding to the word. Are you ready? Because it wouldn't be Easter. Christ is risen. It is wonderful to have everyone gathered as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus this morning. It's wonderful, as we've noted, to have our beloved music director back with us. And it's great to have Mike with us on the organ this morning as well. I always feel like I overshadow you a little bit. We eagerly anticipate some baptism shortly, or at least I know I do. So, as we've traveled through the Lenten season, we've gone through a series that's called Full to the Brim. And it's a little different look than a traditional Lent. We started out remembering that God wants us just the way we are, and we're to look at the whole person that we are. Remembering that we're a created child of God. We remembered that in our faith journey when the road is rough, the light is gone, our strength is failing, we are still loved and still have a calling. A calling to serve, a calling to care, and a calling to love. We were reminded that God loves us. God loves us when we make a mistake, when we have sinned, when we have fallen short of the expectation God has set for us. We, nevertheless, are cared for by God. Because no matter how badly we mess up, we're a loved child of a caring parent forever. And as a result of that love, we're under God's protection all the time, no matter what. We were reminded that we're worthy of the love and grace of God, just in the place we are, just the way we are, without expectation. We cannot separate ourselves from the grace and forgiveness and support of God. God believes in us, even when we may not have given any real reason for the support and love. 
we saw ourselves in jealousy, in love, and acceptance, and in shame and disgrace, and realized that God loves us, no matter what. Setting the example for loving and supporting others. We were reminded that God did not call for perfection from us, as none of us are and can be, no matter how many times we give Tim a hard time that he is the image of perfection. There is beauty in the broken. There is value in the lessons learned. And there is strength in the healing. And we were poignantly reminded that there are times when we're called to cry out to God, to cry out for our brothers and sisters, to cry out for guidance. Living fully is understanding that what God once said or done will come to pass, and there is not a darn thing we can do about it. So here we find ourselves on the other side of the Last Supper, on the other side of the crucifixion, where as Pastor Jeff mentioned Friday night in his Seven Last Words sermon, it is finished, and that that's the power of God, because when God says it's finished, no one can change that. So here we are, Sunday morning. And we find Mary Magdalene, Mary and Joanna, and maybe a few more. They had seen him carry his cross through the city. They had seen him nailed to it on Golgotha. They had seen his side pierced. And they had seen him die. Now they journey to tend to his body. Knowing from first-hand experience that he had died. They're carrying with them spices and oil, possibly similar to those that Mary Magdalene had washed Jesus' feet with not so long ago. They're traveling in grief, in sadness, and with a heavy load, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. When they arrive at the tomb and find it open and empty, you have to figure they were probably perplexed. I'm sure they became nervous and their heart started to beat just a little bit faster with each passing moment as they tried to process what was going on. Now, a few years back, I was taking part in a scouting function and part of this event was to see someone through the night. I hiked with them, helping carry their stuff. I got them settled, and I told them, stay here. I'll be back at sunrise. Now, for those of you who know me, I don't do mornings. The single-digit hours are not supposed to come more than once in the course of a day. So, as I slept, my phone died. And as such, so did my alarm clock. Thankfully, I realized it without too much delay, other than the fact that I was awoken by the sun beaming in the window. So I ran as the sun had risen, and I returned to my friend, or at least to the spot that I had left him. When I arrived, I found no spot. My friend was gone, his gear was gone, his firewood was gone and there was not even a scorch mark left on the ground to show where he had been. It was as if he had never been there. I was perplexed. I was nervous. And my heart started to beat a little bit faster as I tried to figure out what happened. 
I asked other people if they had seen my friend, and they told me he'd gone home. I freaked out a little bit. I ran back to the next few places I thought he might be, and then I heard him. He calls my name across the woods, and I instantly recognized the voice. And all was as it should be. You know, the woman at the tomb had to be a bit anxious when no one was at the tomb. You know they had to be a bit perplexed and even a little scared as to where Jesus had ended up and by whom. When they realize what has happened and they return to tell the story, you can expect for others not to believe them. I think we can identify with Peter when he needs to see it to believe what they're telling him. But stop and think about the women again. They're grieving. They were praying and worshiping, as was their custom, as was their tradition. It was part of their own healing from the events that had occurred. They get to the tomb, and there is no body to anoint. There is no skin to clean. There is no odors to mask. And there is no grieving to complete. There's no healing to happen because there is no loss that has occurred. Their tears of sadness become tears of joy. Their heavy burdens are lifted and their songs of grief turn to songs of joy. Three years ago, we approached Easter with a church in turmoil. We had no baptisms. We had no pastor. We had no definitive plan. But we had hope. We had a vision. And we had a desire. No one saw a college student in the congregation and a tattooed motorcycle riding teddy bear serving together here at First Christian Church Middletown. No one saw a congregation that was going to start to do new things with new people in a new way. When I was commissioned with your support, I had so many visions and so many ideas, and along came COVID. Ideas turn to panic and change, lots of running and lots of nerves. In that time, I started to get to know the process for funeral planning pretty well. I buried church family, individuals who had been mentors, friends, parents and grandparents, many times with limited witnesses and very little ceremony or closure. People suffered from that lack of closure. I suffered from that lack of closure. But today I stand where once was thought to be a tomb. Instead, on a bright Sunday morning, that grief and loss has turned to celebration and joy. The sounds of an old rugged cross have turned to Christ arose. The voices of if we do this next year, have turned to next year when we do it, we can do it better. Today we stand as a testament to the resurrection in Jesus, in our lives, in our world, and in our church. If we look for the dead, we will not see the living. If we focus on the bad, we miss the good. If we focus on the threat, we miss the protection. And if we miss all of those things, was Christ's death in vain? I stand here in a church three Easter's later 
with two pastors who are the yin to the yang and the peanut butter to the jelly, a church that will baptize as many new Christians in 12 months as in the last 12 years. A church that has suffered so much loss and yet sees their gifts they have gained and gives thanks. Today we celebrate the resurrection. Today we celebrate new life. Today we celebrate the interruptions to our plans, the nervousness of the unknown, and the exhilaration and excitement of the realization that we do truly serve a God of life, a God of love, and a God of grace. Let us go out into the world despite turmoil in our world, despite death, despite despair, grieving, and pain. Let us go out into the world with excitement and joy, with hearts beating fast, with nerves on edge, and with the excitement exuding from our very being that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ has risen, he has risen indeed. Christ has risen. Shout it, sing it, speak it, live it. Amen. As we come to the table with this being Easter morning, we think about the scripture. We think about Peter running to the tomb. You stop and think about that for a minute. You're told something you can't believe, and so you go running. You have to know he was praying while he was running. He was waiting to see if his friend Jesus was right around the next bend. Or the bend after that, or the bend after that. Did it really happen? He ran with excitement. I don't know about you, sometimes that's how I come to the communion table. It's an exciting moment. I can't wait to get there. I'm looking forward to it. There are other moments when we come to the communion table and we come a little more slowly, a little more beat down and a little more worn out. But nevertheless, we come to the table. We have the opportunity to gather at a table that, while it's only yay long, physically speaking, it expands to unlimited seating, and all are welcome to come. If you are visiting with us this morning, it is our practice and tradition that all are welcome at this table. We believe in the Christian church that we invite all to the table as God has invited us. As we come forward this morning, if you would like and feel called, you may place a gift in the offering plate and then we will have hand sanitizer and servings of communion on either side. With that being said, we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks for it, he broke it and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Likewise, on that night, he took a cup, and after giving thanks for it, he shared it with them, saying, This is my blood shed for you as the new covenant for the forgiveness of sin. So often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he shall return. 